Hello, everyone, and welcome to the safe handling of patients during COVID, um, which is part of the series of uh, webinars for the Applied Ergonomics Conference, which will be held in March 22nd through 25th this year. <clears throat> Today's presentation is going to be given by uh, Linda Enos. Linda is, uh, a, as you can see, very well qualified. She has um, she is a certified occupational health nurse with her RN, also a certified professional ergonomist as well. She has 30 years of work and consulting experience, both in healthcare and in industrial environments. She holds um, her undergraduate degree in nursing and graduate degrees for, in human factors from University of Idaho. Her work experience is especially pertinent for today's discussion as she um, does a lot of consultation for safe patient handling and um, ergonomics at over 40 hospital systems and clinics. And um, a, her work includes uh, development, facilitation, and evaluation of safe patient handling programs. She is a very um, applied person. She uh, works directly to provide staff training and clinical coaching and problem solving right at the bedside to help nurses and other staff address patient mobility challenges. Um, she has also assisted with teaching in um, large hospital se um, settings in Oregon. So with that, um, thank you very much for joining us today. And thank you very much, Linda, mm -hmm. for presenting. Thanks, Holly, and good morning, everyone. Well, it's morning here in Oregon. I'm on the West Coast. We're gearing up for a big snowstorm. I think some of you are already experiencing that, but it's kind of rare for us, so it's an interesting day. Um, as Holly said, I, I have a very varied background. I still work a little bit in industrial ergonomics, but um, during COVID, my focus has been actually working with Oregon Health Science University in Portland. I've I've been um, helping to manage their safe patient handling program there for the last 10 years. Um, so I do a lot of the training. Um, I'm training some other staff up to help me right now. But we do a lot of patient consultation, and that includes patients with COVID and on our COVID units. So hopefully um, what I have to share with you today will be useful. Um, I won't get too much into clinical. I don't know who the audience is and your background. So um, uh, and, and if there's anything I cover that we don't have in handouts, I'll review in a second, please email me. Um, you've got my email there on the screen and there'll be handouts posted a little bit uh, later on. I'm going to assume that you know something about safe patient handling and a little bit about COVID. Um, I'm sure we all know quite a lot about COVID in the last year, whether we like it or not. But um, as you know, COVID-19 is the disease and SARS-CoV-2 is the virus that causes the disease. Um, just, I'm going to just use the term COVID as we go through out today. So what I thought we'd go through is um, a little bit of a primer on um, the issue of manual handling of patients. So we're all on the same page and, and then really to highlight why safe patient handling and mobility is more important than ever now in our healthcare systems in the US. Uh, we'll review proning uh, using safe patient handling or SPHM to prone patients, some early uh, and progressive mobility with COVID patients. I have some ergonomics tips that I'm excited to share with you later. And then um, if we have time, I will review a little bit about training during COVID and what we've been doing um, at, at the hospital that I work at primarily. Um, we will have handouts posted. If you need them before they're posted, you can email me. But I'm, I've given you an extensive list of resources with links around safe patient handling. And then I just wanted to have some resources that are from the OSHA Alliance program. Um, uh, they're up-to-date COVID-19 resources for all industries that I think might be useful for some of you if you don't already have them. Linda. Yes. Linda, I need to just step in and say I forgot to mention this regarding questions, we will be taking them at the end, but please post them in the Q&A uh, box or the chat box, either one, we will get those questions at the end of your talk today. Thank you. Thanks, Holly. Well remembered, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So it's a pretty full session. Anyone that's heard me speak before and oh, I've always got a lot to say. So <laughs> definitely better at the end. Uh, what I will say today is the focus is acute care hospitals. Um, however, you know, the, the things that I'm going to discuss with you with safe patient handling can certainly be applied in long term care settings to maintain function. We obviously are dealing with COVID in nursing homes and, and in the community setting as well. So I, I will 
kind of get back to that a little later. Um, so some context, we still, and I, I've been in healthcare ergonomics, I came back to it from industry about 20 years ago, and I'm still saying the same thing. Back injuries from manual handling are the number one cause of injuries to all healthcare workers in the US. Uh, it's not quite the same in other countries, but we won't get into that. We still have a long way to go here. Um, and and um, these are most overexertion related injuries. Um, what I will say though, is this is just one injury uh, or source of injuries in healthcare. I consider healthcare as high risk because we're also exposed to um, workplace violence, which is a very hot topic right now um, and has been increasing significantly, including throughout this COVID period, we're seeing more violence in our hospitals. People are angry, disgruntled. There's a lot of different reasons. Um, we see slips, trips and falls are actually the second leading cause of injuries for healthcare workers. We have exposure to other diseases, not just COVID and chemicals um, and, and psychosocial, psychological risk factors as well. So it is a quite a complex and high risk industry. That's, that's my, my take on this and especially not just in hospitals, but across the healthcare continuum. So um, we know that nursing aides are still in the top three occupations for back injuries related to lifting patients. Actually, emergency medical workers right now are number one. Um, uh, and this hasn't changed over the last few years. And as you can see from this slide, um, the ANA did a Healthy Nurse, Healthy Nation survey in 2018, and over 50% of nurses reported experiencing musculoskeletal pain at work during the past year. And we know that in healthcare, underreporting of any injury um, can be as much as 50%. And actually, in the case of violence, it's closer to 90. So we don't see the full picture, and that, um, that concerns me uh, greatly. So very quickly, um, just to kind of give us some context, what are the risk factors um, that lead to MSDs when we're looking at manual patient handling? As you're probably aware, the first one is the weight of the patient. If they can't move themselves, we're having to lift and handle a lot of weight. And there was a study done by Tui Main in 1997 that said if we have four patients in a shift, we're turning and moving them, and the average weight of the patient's 200 pounds, um, we're moving them every two hours. Um, we might be lifting as much as 1.8 tons in an eight hour shift, which is actually a Subaru Forester fully loaded, I've measured it out. And then in a 12 hour shift, that's um, uh, 2.1 tons. And if you take that over 10 years, it's something like 4,500 tons of weight. So I always like to use that when I'm teaching staff to really give them context about how dangerous this is. So we have forceful exertion, we've got the awkward, um, you know, every, every patient has a different body habitus. So we've got a lot of awkward postures that we use when we're moving patients manually. And then um, we've got this unpredictable behavior, unlike boxes and inanimate objects in, in materials handling, we don't know what patients are gonna do. And as we're seeing, they're getting sicker in hospitals. This was happening before COVID, it's, it's more so now. They come in when they're very sick, they're older, they often have cognitive impairments such as dementia, Alzheimer's, brain injury, um, and they're confused. And that, that also leads to some other risks for us as well. So we don't know what they're going to do. They can move unpredictably. And then we've got repeated exposure over time duration uh, factor uh, to, these risk factor, uh, to these risk factors for MSDs. So just to give you some quick pictures, and I hope they come out uh, clearly enough um, in your in, on your screen, um, these are some examples, typical examples of manual patient handling. And, you know, probably some of you know this, but when we're, when we're looking at what's happening to the spine, we have compressive forces that end up at L5-S1, but what really kills us with patient handling is the um, front to back, side to side, AP lateral shearing at L5-S1 which it takes a lot less force of shear force to cause damage to the back over time. And, and I want, we don't have time to get into to the etiology of back injuries and patient handling, but this has been well researched. Bill Maris at Ohio State has published on this and done some great work as well as, as other universities on why manual handling is so dangerous. And then our, our greatest risk is typically um, what we have what highest frequency task is boosting, turning, repositioning patients in bed. So we see a lot of injuries related to that. Um, and then the highest risk overall is lifting patients manually from the floor. We don't do it frequently, hopefully, um, but it's very dangerous for the patient. They have been dropped and some don't make it um, and have expired. Um, and it's dangerous for the staff. Um, so all of these tasks have been um, well researched as to being high risk for, the, for, for those uh, risk factors I just um, described to you. 
So the bottom line is there's no safe way to lift patients manually who can't move themselves. And that's regardless of age, gender, or fitness level. Um, and some of you might have heard there's a safe lift limit of 35 pounds. That was one study that Dr. Tom Waters did for NIOSH 2007. And that only applies if the patient's close to the body and you're lifting under ideal conditions. Uh, which doesn't happen in healthcare. So from my perspective as an ergonomist, if I look at the biomechanics of the spine, I would actually say 20 pounds is a safer lift limit. I'm just gonna throw that out there for you. You might disagree. Um, the different types of tasks that workers are exposed to depend on their, their, their job title. So for example, uh, workers in uh, imaging might be exposed to more lateral transfer tasks. So we have to design our programs and our equipment use around um, the tasks being performed in those departments or specialties. So some other risk factors though, just it's not just the patient and forceful exertion. We work in very confined spaces, often with a lot of equipment. I'm gonna show you some photos in a minute. And then we have poor work practices that I'm gonna circle back to at the end when we talk about ergonomic techniques and um, some better ways to do our work, working smarter versus harder. And I'm sure you're all familiar with that. If any of you have started in healthcare and got into ergonomics, we're all used to working too low and reaching and bending and, and doing extended reaches. Some of the other risk factors you might not be aware of, though, um, when we're talking about manually handling patients, is the risk from violence. And there's some, a small group of well-designed studies that look at if we manually handle patients, we see an increased risk of violence-related injuries to healthcare workers. Either we're very close to that patient, so we're in the direct line of fire, if they're going to hit us, bite us, scratch us, or when we get close to them, it's a trigger for violence. And this is very relevant right now because there's a good chance we're going to see federal legislation related to violence prevention in healthcare uh, in the coming year. Um, and, and this is interrelated with safe patient handling. What I also see is that when we manually handle patients, we're very close to them. We have the increased risk of exposure to body fluids. So if you think about COVID and coughing, you really don't want to be this close to your patient as you can see in the photographs here. Um, we have no evidence around this as I can find that's been published. But when I joined OHSU 10 years ago, a lot of body fluid exposure was to my transporters and their then lift team from manual handling. And we do see that with EMS workers as well. So there's other reasons to use safe patient handling, not just to prevent MSDs. Um, got a couple more slides on the background here to put it into context for you. So you're probably used to the iceberg slide when we look at safety and injuries and the, the true cost of in workplace injuries to workers. Um, you know, we have the work comp costs from back injuries when we're manually lifting patients. We also have indirect costs, so the cost to replace staff temporarily or permanently. And at OHSU, we actually measure that temporary cost and those costs to replace a nurse or CNA or tech while they're on lost time or modified duty is nearly double those of the work comp costs. So they're worth capturing if you can. But what really uh, keeps me awake at night is what goes on under the iceberg. We have staff that are working in pain due to MSDs, that, that it leads to presenteeism, it leads to fatigue and potentially medical error, though we haven't made that link yet. Um, we have decreased efficiency and burnout and we certainly have higher staff turnover. We have, um, you know, we address often manual handling with body mechanics training and there is no evidence that reduces back injuries in any industry worldwide. And then we have that relationship between fatigue and error, especially in healthcare, that's a great concern. And for the organization, this also, all of this impacts the quality of care, the um, outcomes for patients and the patient experience. And in the US, it's a fee for service private business. So if a patient doesn't have a good experience at one hospital, they can go somewhere else for service. So patient experience is a very hot, hot topic right now as hospitals are losing a lot of money uh, during this COVID crisis. Um, so if we look at the impact of manual handling on the patient, the staff and the healthcare organization, I want you to think about the impact of workplace violence because that's such, such a prevalent topic right now and we see the same impact and then we want to overlay that with the impact of the pandemic. Um, and what we're seeing in, a, in, the, in the pandemic is uh, a lot of physical risk factors such as you know, moving patients manually, wearing a lot of PPE in very confined spaces, uh, working with equipment that maybe not be ergonomically designed. 
And then from the psychological or psychosocial perspective, um, you've probably seen in the news, it's a very high stress environment. Even if you're working in a hospital where we don't have a lot of COVID patients in Oregon, that's the case. We, we're not like California, but we're always short staff. Staff are burning out. They're doing some interesting kind of shortcuts, safety related that I'm seeing even in my practice. They have the inability to go home to their loved ones. Uh, we saw that when, when this started in New York, the fear of taking this virus home, um, compassion fatigue and vicarious trauma is certainly something we're seeing um, in healthcare. So it's very worrying the impact on all staff and not just our direct care staff, it's the EVS that housekeeping, it's the food service staff, it's maintenance, it's it, all that support structure. Um, and actually today, Joint Commission just published a, an event, a Sentinel event alert on the impact of COVID to the safety and health of healthcare workers. And they strongly recommend using safety and ergonomics to address this and the hierarchy of control. So um, it, 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 we, we've got, I'm gonna come back to this at the very end and the, and the full significance. I did wanna throw one other stat out there for you. Um, Liberty Mutual actually measured the cost of overexertion injuries in healthcare in 2017, and it was $1.77 billion to healthcare in overexertion related injuries, workers' comp costs only. Um, that's a, a terrific amount of money and outlay. And we're certainly gonna to have to focus on getting that under control more in the future as healthcare changes due to COVID. So consequences of manual handling for our patients though, we've talked about staff and organization, we have good evidence base to show that um, we can do a lot of damage to our patients through manual handling, skin and joint damage. We have increased risk of falls because we can't support their weight and they're unpredictable and their knees buckle. So we're always gonna try and prevent a fall manually. That doesn't work out well for patients or staff. Um, I was a patient a few years ago, actually at OHSU, and um, this department didn't have lift equipment yet, and they moved me manually. It was painful and it was undignified. Um, so we we have to do better um, and 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 uh, use safe patient handling to improve that patient experience and outcome. We also see that unfortunately, when we lift larger patients, those that may be combative or aggressive, we don't have enough staff or equipment and we're tired at the end of 12 hour shifts, which is the norm for a lot of direct care staff in the US, that we don't complete our nursing tasks. And this is quite serious because the two tasks that we don't complete are ambulation and repositioning bed. Those are the top two, there are many others. But when we don't ambulate and position, reposition our patients, it's very detrimental for the patient. And I'm going to get into that in a second with early mobility because that's directly related to COVID. And then just lastly on this background, if you, if you don't have a safe patient handling program now, this is not the time to start one in the middle of a pandemic because it relies on the organization being in the right place with their culture. And it's got to be multifaceted as we know from the evidence base. And if you've done ergonomics programs, you'll see a lot of similarities there. It has to be multifaceted. You can't just buy equipment. Um, that just won't work. You have to have equipment, training, sling supply, and the coaching and, and the organizational culture and look at the design of the workspace as well and so on and our patient condition. So it takes all of these facets to have a good program. And as I said, if you don't have this now, um, you know, at least try to, to plan for this, looking at the benefits of having this in the future as we deal with COVID and get back to some kind of normal, whatever that's going to be. So now I wanna get into some of these tasks um, that we can use safe patient handling for with our COVID patients. And quite frankly, everything I'm going through is what we were doing before, if you have a, a program with equipment and so on, with our, our non-COVID patients. It's really put the spotlight on our, the value of safe patient handling though. And I'm sharing what we've done at OHSU, but also a lot of my colleagues across the country and what I've been hearing in our industry. So hopefully this is useful for you. I'm sure many of you have heard that we we do uh, we have to prone a lot of COVID patients when they get to the ICU and they're very sick. Um, kind of as a life saving measure, we turn them onto their stomach um, to help the lung give the lungs a break um, and help us um, you know uh, facilitate treatment. So a lot of COVID patients end up with acute respiratory distress syndrome. And if you've looked at the news um, reels on COVID from across the world, you'll see patients in ICU and non-ICUs on their stomach. And this is the proning because a lot of these patients have ARDS and it is a leading cause of death in our COVID patients. 
Um, and then proning can be used on our patients that are ventilated, that need that help to breathe, and on non-ventilated patients. And in fact, in other countries like the UK, where we have a lot of community-based safe patient handling as well, they're using proning in the home and in nursing homes. Um, so I'm going to talk about acute care, but it certainly can be applicable to other environments. And hopefully you've got some safe patient handling technology um, to help you there. Um, proning allows increased ventilation of the lungs, and oxygenation, oxygenation of the blood, um, and it really can help avoid ventilation and intubation with patients with COVID and reduce the risk of death. Um, and sometimes for proning, we're proning patients for 16 hours a day. Um, so and I'm going to get into a kind of our process at OHSU a little later and what, what we've learned. I want to mention something called ECMO. Um, it's not a good Scrabble word, unfortunately, extra corporeal membrane oxygenation. Basically, it's heart-lung bypass, and it's been used for years in adults and peds uh, treatment as a last resort to save lives and to give the heart and lungs a break. So we take the blood out, we take the, the carbon dioxide out of the blood, we put oxygen oxygen back in, warm it up, get it back to the body, and we're bypassing the heart and lungs. And the reason I'm bringing this up is we often see this used with our COVID patients in, in conjunction with proning. And I've got some links for you. If you're interested in learning more from the clinical side, there is some good information out there on YouTube alone. So um, this first uh, technique, I wanna review the manual proning technique with you and what, we, what a lot of hospitals have done for years and they do in countries where they don't have the overhead lifts and other equipment. Um, you, I couldn't show you the video today because of bandwidth. So I provided the link for you. And some of these links are great for understanding the clinical reasons to prone and how to do it safely, but the manual ones, I would, obviously this is not what we want to do. So the first thing is you get lots of staff together, you wrap the patient up, they've got a sheet under them, they've got a sheet with their pillows on top of them, and then you, you roll all the edges of the top sheet and the bottom sheet together. And in the UK, we call this the Cornish pasty, because if you've ever had a Cornish pasty, and I miss them sometimes, I've been here a long time, but still miss my, my pasties. Um, it's like a meat pie with pastry and you roll the edges. So that's why we call it the Cornish pasty. You slide the patient to the edge of the bed, then you lift them up on their side and you turn them onto their stomachs. So there's a lot of lateral movement, lifting, and then control as you turn them over. Meanwhile, you're controlling the ventilator and their airway and all the lines. So in an ICU environment, this makes it look easy in these pictures, but you've got a lot of other devices attached to your patient. Um, and then they finish up here. You can see the top picture is where they finish up in the prone position. What you're not seeing here is um, the tight workspace. And the picture I've got at the bottom of the screen is actually of an ECMO machine. Um, and you can see the kind of workspace challenges we have in the ICUs in the US. There are often private rooms, not the case all over the world, where you have very limited space. And you add these ECMO, ECMO machines and ventilators, and um, then you're really challenged. You need a large number of caregivers, usually in ICU six to eight to do this manually. You've got to think now in COVID, well, we need PPE for all of those six to eight staff. So there's the PPE supply and they're performing the work in PPE. So that's often very hot. You're in full respirator gear. Um, and then we've got the risk factors for musculoskeletal disorders to the caregivers. And actually nobody has measured this specifically with proning, but if you think about sliding the patient to the side, then lifting them up on their side and then proning them over, we already know those tasks are dangerous uh, in an individual fashion. So if we put those together, we know there's some high risk here, plus we have friction and shearing for the patient. So what, what can we do with safe patient handling then? Um, and improve this, uh, reduce the risk for staff and patients and some other benefits for the organization. So I know, uh, I'm sorry that these are not super high quality photos. Um, I, it made my PowerPoint very large, so I kind of reduced the quality here. Um, but about six years ago, I had to develop a proning technique at OHSU. I had two hours to do it. We were proning a lot of patients and we were using a special proning bed. But unfortunately, those beds have weight limits and you can't prone patients for more than two hours without significant risk of pressure injuries on the face, uh, the patient's face. So we developed a technique that's being used daily in adults and peds ICUs with uh, two slings and an overhead ceiling lift. And our ceiling lift looks actually a little bit different, but it works 
with different hangar bars. Um, and um, I realized this morning, I actually didn't give you the right link in the PowerPoint to this process. So it's up here now, but you can look, go to alpha modalities. I'm not selling them at all, but the process is on their website under training tools. And I can send this to you if you're interested. We actually use the lift to lift up a patient to the edge of the bed as we do normally when we're, we're turning them. And then we turn them, if you look at number three and four, we're actually using the lift to turn the patient on their side. Um, and the key here is we've placed a second sling at a specific position on the bed ready to receive the patient. And there's a lot of setup with this as well as there is with proning, whether we do it with equipment or manually. Um, we don't have time to get into all of that today, but I'm gonna, I've given you some links for that. As we turn the patient over in five and six, we're then on six and seven going to use that um, receiving sling to move them back to the middle of the bed. And picture eight is a little deceiving. It looks like their head is down. It actually wasn't. It's the angle of the photo. But you can adjust the sling to lift them up in a prone position so you're not hyperextending their back and you can keep them comfortable. Um, and the, you could have turned them onto pillows. So there's a lot of different ways to do this. But we've been using this now for six years and it's extremely um, popular with the staff and it requires a lot less staff than six to eight. Normally it's four. They might add staff if they if they have other concerns with lines or, or, or the ventilator. Um, but the key with proning is always having somebody at the airway, um, which is usually our respiratory th uh, technicians and therapists who are controlling the airway and the ventilator if that's present. So um, there are other variations on this theme with the ceiling lift. And I can tell you, this is a very quick technique as well. Uh, I'm gonna talk about some caveats in a minute, but you can put a friction reducing device underneath that receiving sling. Um, you could put the rec receiving sling on top of the patient with pillows like the Cornish pasty I just showed you. Um, there's a lot of variations on a theme here and having a friction reducing device means you can slide the patient to the center of the bed versus them picking them up with the lift. It's entirely up to what you have um, in your facility and what staff are trained and comfortable in using. And I've given you a link to the VA. They, they've done some great work on proning. And this is a link that shows you using, uh, they bundle their sling on top of the patient. So it's a slightly different way of using a ceiling lift. We've also got friction reducing devices. Um, you can use these can be uh, plastic slippery sheets, nylon tube sliders, nylon sheets. Um, that we have a gel one called a slip with gel. Uh, it's a slider with gel in, in OHSU. There are many different types on the market. So this link to Rush University also walks you through how to do proning uh, from the clinical perspective. And it shows you how they've used the friction reducing device to, to slide the patient to the side and to start the turning mechanism. It still doesn't get rid of all the risk factors, but it's, it's definitely a low tech, cheap and disposable option that can help you. And then lastly, you can prone with an air assist device. This happens to be one of a few on the market, the Hovermat uh, by Hovertech. Again, I'm not here to promote any vendors, but there's, there's several others out there. And in this case, there's a link to the VA video. They're using the disposable air assist device, which they buckle together, one under and one over the patient. You can see in the top photo, they inflate the bottom one, and then they can slide the patient to the edge of the bed and then start to tip them. And I've done a lot of proning with these air assist devices. So um, it can work very well. So if you don't have an overhead lift, this can be an option for you. So just some things to consider, though, when you're developing a proning technique, if you don't have one right now, or before I get into this, I forget, floor lifts, or people call them the Hoyas, that's a brand name, but floor lifts can be used for turning, um, for proning. You really can only turn the patient up on their side, though. You can't, the floor lift doesn't have a, a big enough arc of movement, range of motion to get the patient fully into a prone position, usually. But you could use them for part of the task if that's all you have. You have to consider workspace with a floor lift and then the cleaning afterwards unless they're just dedicated to a COVID unit. So what you're going to remember, if, if you look at some of these videos I provided, you'll notice the ergonomics leave a lot to be desired. People are bending and there's a lot of extended reaches. So we're going to talk about that at the end and how you fix that. But I see a lot of these practices developed by experienced safe patient handling technicians and, and practitioners, but they don't always know that ergonomics piece that, that, that can make it, you know, take it to the next level and reduce some of those awkward postures. You do have to consider the size of the patient and their body habitus, their shape. 
Um, all of the videos I see are performed with sim dummies or small staff. If you're proning someone that's 250 pounds and up, say 400 pounds, it is a different ball game completely. And you really have to have that procedure lined out well before you try it with a patient of size. You're gonna to have to have a wider bed. You're probably gonna to have to use air assist or ceiling lift technology because your friction reducing device won't be sufficient to reduce those forces unless you have a lot more staff. Um, always check with your equipment vendor before you, when you're developing your process, make sure that you can use their equipment in that way. Because proning is kind of the non-traditional way of using lift equipment. Um, and you want that approval from your vendor that helps with liability as well. And they may have some other ideas for you. And then if you're going to use the air assist match, you might need permission about a blower. The motors blow air. We don't want to aerosolize the virus. Um, but we also have other things that blow air in ICUs, such as air mattresses and um, SCDs, or these are compression devices we use to prevent blood clots in legs. These all run on an air device. But again, you want to check with infection control in your ICU teams uh, if you're going to use those air mats, particularly in that ICU environment. Um, you also need to think about infection control. So do you use disposable equipment versus uh, washable equipment? So at OHSU, we actually use our regular um, slings that go straight into the laundry bag after we've used them. We don't use disposable slings. The cost is too high and it's not necessary. But for your air assist devices and your friction reducing devices, there are a lot on the market and certainly the low tech devices can be well under $200, $50, um, you know, so, so it, may, it may then be a cost effective to use single patient use or disposable. But again, you need to work this out with your team. Have a checklist before going into the room. There's some examples of those on the video links. You've got to be well prepared. You need all your supplies because we're short staff now. We may not have a runner available. You have to have clear communication with your team and roles and responsibilities. And you want staff doing this who are experienced with the technology, with the lift technology. Uh, this is a more advanced practice, so they, they can't be new, new to this or they need a lot more training and coaching. And then what I was intrigued about is a process of using proning teams at Mass General. Uh, this last year, I had a webinar on this. They actually took um, staff who were reassigned from the ORs. We've done this at OHSU and other hospitals I work with. A lot of staff are reassigned to ICUs, which is pretty daunting if you're an, an OR nurse or you've not been in that ICU environment. But Mass General actually put them on their proning teams. They use lift equipment, they train them, and they go around and do all the proning on their ICUs. They have multiple ICUs. So that's another way of addressing proning that might be more efficient from a staffing point of view. And then the benefits of um, using SPHM for proning, you have less staff, you have less PPE savings, you've got more control of the process. We're reducing risk of injury to staff and patients. And I will say in using the ceiling lift, once the patient is proned, it is much easier to turn the patient in a prone position and to turn their head and manage all the secretions that you have to keep out of the way because they're gonna secrete a lot from their lungs um, and you have to constantly clean up and turn their head to prevent, prevent pressure injuries. So it's a little easier with the ceiling lift if you have that technology. So I'm watching my time here. As I said before, I always have a lot to say. Um, so hopefully that gives you a kind of quick and dirty on how you might use technology to um, prone patients. But then the second part of this is, OK, if we have our patients in ICU on a ventilator, they're often there for a long time, weeks and months. You've heard this on the news. Our COVID patients are there for a long time. Um, you spend a week in bed in ICU on a ventilator, you lose 30 percent of your muscle mass. So we have to think then, how are we going to mobilize these patients successfully and get them home? And that truly, from my perspective, the only way to do this is with safe patient handling um, and something called early mobilization. So um, this has been a hot topic in the US and around the world for the last 10 years. We now know that when we get patients up, the sooner we get them up and out of bed, we have better patient outcomes. And the bottom line is they have a better mortality rate. They don't die as quickly and they have a better quality of life. Um, so this has been well researched. It hasn't been well researched when we were using equipment, safe patient handling equipment as well. But here's a definition of early mobility. And it, we use this in long term care to maintain function as well. It's not, you know, in acute care, we want to discharge them and get them back to a baseline if possible. In long term care, they're aging in place. We want to maintain function, activities of daily living and quality of care, quality of life. 
So early mobility, we know, uh, decreases ventilator time, length of stay. It, it prevents uh, muscular weakness and related falls, pressure injuries, deep vein thrombosis, de delirium, and then long-term impacts um, are, are far better for the physical, cognitive, psychological outcomes. And as I said, we have decreased mortality. So we know this is important. Um, and I'm not, the next couple of slides are just there um, for you as an FYI, um, because of time, I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but this is kind of a typical sequence of progressive early mobility. Um, and we start with, if a, we have a bed bound patient, um, we get the head of the bed raised. It's raised somewhat when you're on a ventilator anyway, or if they're a patient of size, then we start turning and boosting and holding and repositioning. Uh, we progress then to some kind of passive range of motion with the limbs, to active range of motion where the patient's moving their limbs themselves. And then we go to sitting at the edge of the bed up to standing and ambulation, hopefully. Now, sitting at the edge of the bed, one of my favorite terms is dangling the patient. I see this at a lot of hospitals. Um, I think it sounds barbaric. And I also seen staff dangling the patient at the edge of the bed. A patient who can barely sit upright is not very cooperative and the patient will slide off the bed or fight or, or become uncooperative and the staff are holding the patient's body weight and trying to prevent a fall. So we have to do this in a, in a safer fashion. Um, and in, say, patient mobilization, we don't know what equipment and slings or, or uh, devices we need to use unless we have an assessment tool and we assess the patient. And then we can choose the right equipment and work practices to move that patient. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, patients will progress from being fully dependent, non-weight bearing, uncooperative, to partially weight bearing, to where they just need some supervision verbally, um, or physically light touch cueing to be able to mobilize. So, you know, we have equipment in the safe patient handling world that matches each of these levels. And we use a four level system at OHSU, a lot of hospitals do. There's a lot of different systems out there, but patients in acute care will move from dependent to semi-dependent and go back and forth a lot. So we have to have a tool that measures, okay, what can they do at that point in time and then choose the right equipment to facilitate early mobility. So I'm not going to read all of this, but I'll check our assessment tools. There are many out there. There's something called the bedside mobility tool. Um, there's also one we've we developed in Oregon um, in 2005 with nine hospitals. Happy to share any of this with you if you want to email me. Um, and we use it for peds, adults and ICU at OHSU. We have one tool we use hospital wide. Um, but we look at the patient's abilities physically, cognitively, their clinical needs, the tasks being performed the work environment design and the number of staff needed. And that really helps us perform and make the right decision as to how to move the patient safely. And then I'm going to skip this, but this is if you're not very familiar with say patient handling, this is a list of the types of equipment and the tasks they can complete. Well, so when I say ceiling lifts are really the gold standard, if you're lucky enough to have them, they will do all of your patient handling mobility and activity of daily living tasks. They can be uh, with certain slings um, can help you do all of those. Um, so I'm just going to skip that one. It's there for a reference for you. So before we get into some examples of equipment and early mobility, the one thing as ergonomists and those of us in safe patient handling need to realize is that not all equipment is created equal. Even within categories of ceiling lifts, some of them are, are, have better functionality than others. And I've actually given you a link in the handouts to um, an equipment checklist that we've had published a few times. That's kind of like a consumer's checklist. If you're gonna buy equipment, these are the things you really need to look for as a healthcare organization or a user. But we cut, you know, if I, if I look at friction reducing devices versus a, the slippery sheet versus an air assist versus ceiling lift, they're not gonna reduce the, the risk of injury, those forceful exertions in the same way. Um, and one of the things I've used frequently is the rapid entire body analysis or REBA to assess uh, pre-equipment or to when I'm choosing equipment, I'll assess the risk of MSDs using REBA and then go in afterwards to see how we've reduced the risk of MSDs. So you can Google REBA if you're not familiar with it. And it, it's, it was designed by Sue Hignett and others in the UK for assessing the risk of MSDs in healthcare workers it, um, is particularly good for healthcare. So be an informed consumer when you're looking at equipment. Don't let the vendor sell you. Um, so you're going to always do user, user testing, evaluation, work out the processes that fit your environment and patient population. 
So for in-bed mobility, let's start with that one first. You can use ceiling lifts with turning and repositioning slings. And there are many types of slings out there. We don't have to get, we don't have to time to get into that. What I will throw in right now is I've I've had the privilege of being part of a ISO one, uh, 10535 um, committee, and we've just finished revising the, the ISO standard for the design and manufacture of patient lifts and slings. This is a consensus standard in the US, so the FDA used this standard to regulate uh, manufacture and sale of slings and lifts in the US. Um, so look for that in the next few months because it has changed significantly to really look at how we use lifts and different slings and compatibility and safety issues. Um, we've also got friction reducing devices. So you can see some of those here. Um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, but um, there's a blue tube slider there for boosting the patient in bed and turning them. The yellow slip is in the bottom right there. What I'm particularly um, proud of at OHSU is that it, we're a teaching hospital and they've allowed me to work with staff and do time studies and really figure out some um, best work practices that are the quickest way to move patients because time is everything. Um, and we actually don't lay patients supine to, to boost them if we don't have to. That's something Florence Nightingale taught us in the Crimean War in the 1800s. Um, we don't need to do that anymore. We don't need to use gravity. So we boost our patients in repositioning slings with ceiling lifts where we have a ceiling lift with them in a semi-seated position. That's how they are in bed. Um, it is much quicker. I've actually timed a, a supine boost with a lift for up to five minutes because of line management. And using this process, it takes less than a minute. Um, and staff have learned it and found it easier to learn. So anyone wants any more information on that, email me. But there are better ways of doing work. We really have to move forward from some of the things we've done for decades as far as moving patients um, to some of using some real ergonomics here. We have limb slings for active and passive range of motion. You can see some different examples here. This is my colleague in my bariatric suit we use for training. We can put a patient in a sling, you can see in the, in the top right here, and have them dangle at the edge of the bed, but they're secure in the sling. And in, in this case, as I did this with a real patient with rehab, we were doing chin-ups um, to get his upper, upper extremities strengthened. So there's a lot of different ways to use that equipment for in-bed mobility and get them to the next phase where we can get them um, transferred out of bed. Um, there's a lot of different ways to do that. We use that semi-seated position transfer to go to a cardiac chair in ICU and staff are moving the patients continuously throughout a shift with that equipment. That didn't happen before the program. Um, we've got lateral uh, friction reducing devices for lateral transfers. You can see the air mat here. We have that slippery sheet again. So there's a lot of different ways with floor lifts, ceiling lifts to do that non-weight bearing transfer. And again, that's part of early mobility, getting the moving, sitting up, improving heart and lung function. And, and um, to you know, some extent that mus muscle uh, rehab as well. If they're standing, we can use a lot of different equipment again, and this is um, this can be with or without ventilators. So we often ambulate patients on a ventilator or stand and pivot transfer them, and we're going to do that with these devices. And some of these devices have up to an 800 pound or 1000 pound capacity, depending on, on the device, so we can fit any patient size. Um, on the bottom low uh, right there, or left the screen as I'm looking at it, you can see two people, one of them is me in my, in my bariatric suit, um, in a seated sling hooked up to a ceiling lift. And we've got pretty creative with the vendor's permission. We learned this from Christiana Care in Delaware, who've been doing this for 20 years. We use our universal seated slings to actually stand, pivot transfer, and ambulate patients because we have those seated slings on all units. Um, rather than having a walking harness. And what we found is the patient cannot fall. So if their legs buckle, they can't fall. And our rehab staff love this for, for rehab and early mobility. And then uh, lastly, ambulation. When, when we're ready to ambulate, we can do this safely with less staff. Um, and there's a variety of ways of doing that. There's sometimes um, uh, devices that are, uh, we can convert to walkers from sit to stand. So that, hopefully that gives you an idea if you're not familiar with some of this already. Um, there's, there's a myriad of devices. Not all of them are super expensive like our ceiling lifts. I know those can be a tall order to install. They can be expensive. If you're in California and, and at OHSU, we have to meet seismic code. So it gets pretty expensive to put those in the ceiling. There are other devices and especially if you're not in acute care and, and budgets are very tight. So I want to get into some work practices. So if we, if we um, 
remember that the equipment, say patient handling equipment, reduces forceful exertion, but it doesn't take care of awkward postures. So we have to look at our work practices to do that. And what we've um, developed over the years, and I, I'm happy to share this with anyone because um, this is truly applying ergonomics and trying to change behavior which in healthcare staff, which is not easy. The old way for work, if you ask anybody worldwide, where do you set the bed when you're working, they're gonna tell you waist height typically, um, which would accommodate 20% of our users, right? Well, if you, if you put the bed between knuckle height when we're standing with our arms by the side of our body and waist height, we can accommodate 90% of our user population and keep them in an upright position, at least no more uh, bending than 20 degrees forward bend. Um, and this has been eye-opening for our staff. It accommodates someone that's under five foot to somebody that's six foot um, so that they can work with different heights of staff and not worry about trying to keep in that neutral posture. In this country, we have beds with electric controls. We're lucky. There are a lot of fancy controls on these beds. We rarely use them. So getting that bed height up is, is critical and not just for safe patient handling tasks. It also decreases task time and error rate when we're looking at doing fine work like an IV start or suturing. And then the other thing that we've done since Flo Nightingale's era, my grandmother and mother were nurses, they were taught this too, is log rolling. And unless we have a trauma patient with a spinal injury where we still have to turn them manually as a team, we do not need to reach past midline of the bed or the patient and pull them over, which is also very painful. We can actually use something called tip and tuck, or you can pass a draw sheet or a sheet to your colleague. You can see some different methods in these photos, or we can use a ceiling lift if you have the overhead lift. But what we're trying to do is to teach staff to get rid of the bending forward by raising the bed and the not going past midline, which reduces those extended reaches. And then these are some other ergo tips. I'm just going to flash these up because we're nearly out of time here. But if you're using a floor lift or a ceiling lift, teaching staff to bring that hanger bar down to chest height or below will keep them from reaching over chest height um, and also make it quicker to get the sling on and off. And this is all about time. And, and as I said, we've done a lot of time studies around this to prove to staff we can do this quickly, safely and with less staff. And then, um, you know, when we're applying seated uh, some of our slings to patients, a lot of ergonomists have done good work on that. There's still risk factors when we apply a seated sling, but there are ways of applying it with, with re and reducing those risk factors and awkward postures. Um, and some of the other things we've also used at OHSU, we allow our nurses to make the judgment to move patients on their own for in-bed repositioning um, with the ceiling lift and the right sling. Um, so that, that has really helped us with staff, uh, staffing as well. There's some other tips here um, about preparing your work before you do it and getting all the supplies together. Um, but the bottom line is to teach staff to work smarter and not harder. And I'm seeing them work harder than ever now, and they don't need to do that if we apply some core ergonomics. So I know we're nearly out of time here, um, and I'm happy to share any, any more information with training with you. Uh, we, we started when, we, when COVID hit in March, we stopped all of our training. So we normally have four hours of new user training, two hours every two years of refresher training, and then other classes for floor lift and lateral transfer. It, we spent the summer working with other committees and our program was deemed essential so that we could start training staff again in October. Um, I wrote the protocols for this so that I could feel safe teaching and they allowed me to do that. Um, and so we looked at room space and airflow. We have six in a class. Uh, we have pre-screening for COVID and we have specific instructions sent to them about what to expect. Um, and they will be turned away from class if they don't come in and clean scrubs and, um, you know, uh, and if they had any symptoms or are not feeling well. We send out all the handouts to them. There's no paper handouts anymore. Um, we screen them when they come to class. We keep a careful roster for contact tracing. And then we have all the right PPE goggles, um, hospital uh, surgical masks, um, and then our scrubs and gloves and obviously sanitizing gels. Um, and then we keep them socially distanced when they're not doing the hands-on part. But you can't avoid, you know, safe patient handling is a hands-on training. So we have developed an hour online didactic for them and they now come to two and a half hours of hands-on trainings. It's for new users only right now. And you can use a simulation dummy, but I don't actually think it makes much difference. You're going to be close together anyway. So you're gonna have two to three staff close together um, for short periods of time, and then you spread them out after. You do need extra time to set up and clean. I am an ace at cleaning now. I think EVS could hire me. 
Um, and then, you know, keeping track of who's attended class. So we've successfully been able to do our training and we're growing that all the time. However, I've got a thousand staff now that need refresher training. And until I can have more than six in the class, we're not going to be able to tackle that. So we're developing some online training with some of our uh, videos and QR codes. They can flash a smartphone up and look at a video for 30 seconds as a reminder, but it certainly isn't an instead of. They still are going to need that hands-on training at some point. Um, potential benefits then for safe patient handling, patients, uh, mobility and COVID. Um, you can read these. We increase distance between caregivers and patients. We obviously help reduce fatigue, psychological stress, and I didn't mention earlier, psychological stress, as we know, is also uh, tied to an increased rate of MSDs. Um, and actually, I've got a link for you that's a nice paper out of Europe that summarizes MSDs and the psychosocial components and that relationship. Um, and then uh, we can use less staff and decrease time. For patients, we obviously have better outcomes, less friction on skin, fall risk, uh, better overall experience, and hopefully we get them a better quality of life. That's what we're all in, in healthcare to do. Um, and then for the organization, there are huge cost savings. And right now we've had half a million staff, healthcare staff laid off in the US since the beginning of COVID, often associated with outpatient clinics, doctors offices. We are gonna be 2.1 million nurses short next year in the US before we had COVID. So if we wanna keep our staff and keep them healthy and want to attract them to healthcare, although I hear nursing school enrollment is up because of COVID, we have got to start taking care of them in a better way. Um, and we can only achieve these potential benefits because I put potential in here if you have that culture of patient and worker safety and a multifaceted evidence-based program. So the silver lining then to finish up here, the silver lining, I think, for COVID, we're going through a worldwide awful situation. I liken it to being at war because I think that's our mindset right now and we're not sure when it's going to be over or what life will look like at the end of it. I can tell you healthcare is changing already. We will move more to telemedicine. That has increased 90% now. Um, it was a movement before, it will happen more quickly now. We will see more community-based care, although unfortunately in the US, we're not set up for that, especially when it comes to safe patient handling. Unlike Europe, Australia, Canada, and New Zealand, we have a lot to learn. Um, and we will see just the sickest of the sick in acute care. So, so healthcare is going to change, it's going to have to, because budgets are very tight now. We've lost billions of uh, dollars in hospitals because of COVID and not doing our elective surgeries and so on. So I'm not sure where we're going to end up in the next year, but the silver lining, and Joint Commission mentioned this today, is that now there's a more of a focus on healthcare worker safety in this country, and there hasn't been. And a lot of us have been talking about patient safety and the link to worker safety. This is gonna help highlight this now and really help us take care of our healthcare workers. And, I, and I've always said, having worked in industry and ergonomics before coming back to healthcare, we're 20 years behind with worker safety in healthcare compared to general industry. We need to catch up and do it quickly. So I think this might be that, that silver lining with, our, with COVID. So um, uh, after that, I, that, that's all I have. Um, I've got three slides on your handout with various different resources and links for you. And then I've given you a handout with a lot more on safe patient handling overall that you might find useful. There's some free videos on that um, handout as well. So um, Holly, uh, questions? There's a lot of information. Are your heads spinning? <laughs> um, Linda, I'm not sure. I don't see the questions in the question um, and answer box. Um, I, I do think you gave a great, great talk with packed, packed with information. Um, and it's wonderful talk. I have a question for you um, on my own. It is about um, the EMS realm. Um, and do you have any, any guidance around turning people or moving people? Um, you know, not in a hospital setting. A little off topic, but yeah, let me get yeah. back to the let me get back to just me here. Um, yeah, so this is really tough. Uh, EMS have a culture of and, and we see this in, in our operating rooms in the ED of, you know, we can do use body mechanics and that's going to be OK. Um, and what I didn't say earlier is most workers I've worked with in healthcare who are permanently and partially disabled are all under the age of 30. 
it, it's stunning. I mean, I hurt my back at 19 as a student nurse. I couldn't be at the bedside by the time I was 30 anyway, because of this one, 1 1.8 tons we lift. For EMS workers, you've got that double exposure for body fluids. I think, um, you know, there it, there is some, I see some of our ambulance services actually have bariatric ambulances. Um, they use the hover mat or air assist technology and hover jack technology, which is a, like a camp bed, that, camp bed that inflates and you can lower patients down stairways in the home. But the best thing for them really is the disposable low, you know, the friction reducing devices, um, which you can get the plastic ones. They, I've actually got a pediatric air flight team and we use a small plastic one that folds up and goes into their medical kit very easily. It's not as good as some of the others, but it works for them in the field. Um, for lateral transfers, repositioning patients to get to the edge of the bed, um, that's one of the best low tech tools that EMS could use, but it's extremely challenging and we, we really need to address this in, in this environment. Now, having said that though, Holly, um, there's a lot of work at NIOSH and around the world in exoskeleton uh, use in healthcare right now. Um, I know Japan is, is taking leaps ahead on that. Um, I attended a conference there a couple of years ago on this and um, it's quite fascinating on how they might use exoskeletons in healthcare. There's also a lot of concerns, but I think for EMS workers, um, that may be the way forward in the future. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes, very, very helpful. Thank you for all the perspective. Um, I don't know, Carrie, uh, my, uh, my co-host here, Carrie Bastille, do you have any last thoughts or questions? Um, I do actually have one question. As an educator of occupational therapy students working in a school of health professions, we, we run into the challenge of, do we educate our students on how to do it? physically so that they can, they understand what the ergonomics are when we don't always have direct access to the equipment that the students would need to learn and use in a typical hospital exactly. situation. Yeah, I'm so glad you brought that up, Carrie. Actually, I just got off a call before this one. Uh, we have a curriculum work group with the, uh, another association for patient hand, say patient handling. And we're actually, because we've had curriculum for schools and nursing, but it's not well integrated. We're looking at how to integrate curriculum across all disciplines, PT, OT, nursing, techs, uh, and so on. Um, I, what we've done at OHSU, I try to, I try to teach the equipment use years ago with students didn't take on. The faculty didn't were frightened of it. They weren't sure how to use it. So I have a, a, a faculty who was one of my former champions. She's integrated it with me. We teach them core ergonomics. It's didactic um, with MSD principles, not just safe patient handling. And then she's focused on the assessment tool. She actually has them in, in all levels of their four year training, uh, learn to do the assessment. And you could do that with rehab as well um, so that they have that core foundation. And then we show them equipment. We say we're not. You're not going to be competent on it. But let's look at the groups of equipment, and we might teach them on an air, air assist mat lateral tra lateral transfer device because they're a little easier to learn and use. But I, I agree. Everywhere has different equipment, different brands. You have to get that training wherever you're going to work or do your clinical rotation. Um, but I think that core piece is going to be what is ergonomics? We don't get that in any school, really. And then what is this assessment piece to know, OK, how do I make the informed decision of moving and rehabbing my patient safely? Happy to share. I've got a lot of links we've pulled out. If you want any information, just email me. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. And I guess on behalf of the the ergonomics, Applied Ergonomics Conference and webinar. I'm probably stepping over Holly, but I'd like to thank you for joining us today. It's been wonderful. Thank you. And I hope everyone is registered for the conference. It's so much easier now it's virtual for me because it's always a long travel. So I'm so happy to be attending. <laughs> so. Well, thanks, thank for the, thanks for the great uh, discussion presentation today, Linda. Absolutely wonderful as per usual from you. you. And um, I would just like to echo everyone else's um, mentioning of the Applied Ergo Conference March 22nd through 25th. There is a link to register in the chat. Um, and we'd like to thank the whole committee from Applied Ergo would like to thank Linda once more for sharing her expertise with us today. And as mentioned, her handouts will be posted to the Applied Ergo Conference website along with the link to this presentation, which has been recorded. So thank you for joining us today and looking forward to talking with you again 
at the conference in March. And thanks one more time. Okay. Thanks, guys. Great Stay job, safe. everyone. Thank you, Linda. Bye.